Welcome, congregation. May we be blessed by sitting under God's word today. A special welcome to all who are visiting our church today, here or online. Our own pastor, Pastor Mark Wagonar, will lead our services today. For announcements and prayer requests, we'd like to thank Thanks for this past week with the Synodical Committee meetings that that went well. And we also like to pray for Lucy DeCourt, who is suffering with a high uh, fever and virus and is at McMaster, but yet she is recovering and getting better. Our collection for today is for the church, first collection, second collection, is for the Diaconate Fund, the Deacon Fund. Our call to worship is from Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely he, that is Christ, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Let's take up our Psalters and sing from Psalter 163, 1 and 3. 163, 1 and 3. <laughs> Beloved congregation, as we draw near to the Lord in worship, we do so confessing that our help is in the name of the Lord, who has made the heavens and the earth. Amen. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing to the Lord's praise. Psalter 392, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. 392, 1, 2, and 3.
Beloved congregation, sometimes we wonder what Jesus looked like. And we don't know what he physically looked like, but we do know what he morally looked like. Uh, The Ten Commandments perfectly kept. And so as we hear the law of God, see the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who kept these four sinners for whom he also died. Ten Commandments come to us this morning from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Let's sing out of response, Psalter 109. This is coming from Psalm 40 in Hebrews 10. Verse 5 through 7 tells us that this is speaking of Christ, that this is actually Christ speaking, his desire, his resolve uh, to serve and be devoted to the Lord. And this is true then of the Christian by the Spirit's power in Christ. Psalter 109, 1 through 4.
Well, the congregation, our scripture reading for this morning's service is found in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verse 26 through 56. Luke chapter 1, this is page 1579 in the Pew Bible. Today is Palm Sunday. Friday is Good Friday, Sunday is Easter, and yet here we are reading a Christmas text. What is going on? I hope that thought's in your mind, and I hope that gets solved for you in the sermon. Uh, just know that I didn't forget the church calendar. We have a Palm Sunday uh, service this afternoon, but this is very relevant for us today on this day. God's word coming to us from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 56. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He's put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Thus far the reading of God's holy, precious, and infallible word. Having heard God speak to us in his word, let's now turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, my might, my constant helper in the fight my shield, my righteousness. O Lord, left to ourselves, we are so weak, vulnerable, 
And Lord, we have failed often. Your law exposes us as rebels in ourselves. It reminds us of what we've done in our past and what we continue to do. It shows us our sin. And Lord, if that's all we had this morning, then we would be crushed under the burden of our own condemnation. And yet, Lord, you are here this morning with glad tidings and good news. And Lord, this is true for, for your people, whether we are struggling with frustration over our persistent indwelling sin, or whether we are struggling with the sufferings of life, the hardship of life. And so, Lord, we come as those who are poor and needy. And yet we see you, O oh Lord, as you reveal yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ, as the one who is rich in mercy, the one who delights to give good gifts, the one who truly is the rock of your people, our constant helper, our shield who defends us, our strong high tower, our Savior true. O oh Lord, apart from you, we have nothing. There's no hope. We're exposed to the winds of your righteous wrath against sin. We're exposed to all the suffering of living in a cursed world. And yet, in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a hiding place. We have a shelter. One who protects your people. One who surrounds your people. One who is righteous on behalf of your people. One who has kept the law at every point for sinners. One who truly spilt his blood for the vile sins of your people and one who has risen from the dead in victory so that one day there will be no more death, no more loss, no more grief, no more curse. And Lord Jesus, then, if we are here with heavy hearts or whatever frame of mind we are here, we pray that by your Spirit, we would find our healing in your wounds. Lord, if we are here and we are thinking that Christ is irrelevant to our situation, that the Christmas story is irrelevant to our situation, that Good Friday and Easter are irrelevant to our, to our situation, then, oh Lord, help us to see. Give us eyes by your spirit, to behold the Lord Jesus Christ, to see that there's nothing more relevant to us in our sin, our shame, our suffering than this Savior. Lord, we pray for those who are carrying heavy burdens. You know each one. In particular, we pray for uh, the Decorts, as Lucy has been in the hospital this week and uh, dealing with this virus. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen Scott and Alexia and encourage them and be with little Lucy that she might know your care and that she would come to full health. And Lord, may there be faith worked in each heart that you are good, that your purposes are good, and that your ways are good even when we don't understand. Lord, we pray this for all of us especially those carrying heavy burdens. Lord, we pray for those who have recently lost loved ones or those who are dealing with various griefs, whether it's the grief of wayward children, the grief of losing a child in, in miscarriage, the grief of infertility, whatever our particular struggles are, Lord, help us to find our comfort in Christ. And Lord, as we this morning think about unplanned pregnancies 
and how abortion thrives in our land. And Lord, these are sensitive topics of murder of the unborn and of shame to so many parties involved. O oh Lord, we pray again that the gospel would come with its full relevance to each particular heart. Lord, we pray for the cause of life in our land as 300 babies each day are murdered and counted unfit to live in this world. Lord, our hearts so often are calloused, and yet, Lord, we, we grieve over this. And we pray for those who especially in various ways, can give of their time and energy, who are on the front lines, who are raising awareness about these things. Lord, encourage them. Strengthen them. Lord, especially we pray for our youth who are involved in this in, in different ways. And we thank you for all of our youth in general, for the senior young peoples as we could have the breakfast yesterday. And Lord, we pray for all of our youth that each one would be by your spirit, servant-hearted, mission-minded young people who see that they too have a calling upon them to live for Christ in their own capacity, in their own place. Lord, that they would see the beauty of Christ and that they would want to give whatever gifts you've given to them back unto you. And Lord, we pray this for all ages in our congregation. We thank you for uh, the young adults, for the middle-aged, for uh, the seniors and elderly. Lord, each one you've given us life for a reason. And so, Lord, help us to live for your glory. Help us to open our hands to receive of the love of Christ. And then as we receive of his life, of his love, to show his love to others, wherever you've placed us, whether that's through prayer or through time and energy, through giving of our gifts and resources, whatever way we can serve, Lord, help us to be willing servants. Lord, we thank you also for our federation and for the committee meetings that could be had. We pray for our federation. Lord, forgive us for our many sins. Humble us where there's pride and cause us to rejoice more and more with, with boldness in the Lord Jesus Christ and that each of our churches would be Christ-centered and God-glorifying, that we would be submissive to your word and that we would be filled with your spirit so we might be faithful witnesses in this day. Lord, uh, we pray for the vacant churches. We ask that you would uh, bless each of these congregations, that you would shepherd them through uh, the elders and, Lord, in your own timing, that you would send them pastors. And to that end, we pray for students for the ministry we pray for our brother, Karsten Koopman, who's studying right now and who had a, committee, a meeting this week with the committee. We pray that that would have gone well and that his studies would continue to be blessed to him. And Lord, we pray for more students for the ministry, that you would raise them up and equip them and uh, thrust them forth into the harvest. But Lord, for each of us who carry the name of Christ, help us to grow in our witness of this Christ. Lord, what a Savior you are, and what a privilege to live for you and to speak of you. Lord, we thank you for each visitor joining us today. We pray that your Spirit would apply your word to each of our hearts, and that we would leave this place leaning upon the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, the congregation, at this time, we have the opportunity to give to the Lord uh, of the many gifts he's given to us. The first collection is for the church. The second collection is for the deacon fund. Following that, we'll sing Psalter 79, stanzas 1, 2, and 3, titled Thoughts of God's Loving Kindness. Psalter 79, 1, 2, and 3. <laughs>
Beloved congregation, I invite you to turn with me again in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. I'd like to read verse 31. Luke chapter 1, verse 31. This is page 1579. Here's the announcement of the angel to Mary, verse 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Dear congregation, I want you to picture with me a young unmarried woman. She's in tears. A pregnancy test has just confirmed her worst fears. She's pregnant. And it's a crisis. The voice in her head is screaming, you can't be pregnant. You're too young. This is not what you had planned. This will ruin your life. This will ruin your future. And as she tells the father of the child, he coldly says the same thing. This isn't happening. You need to get rid of it. Otherwise, you're all alone to care for it, this thing. The more she thinks about it, the more fear fills her chest. Fear of of the disappointment her parents will have when she shares the news. Fear of the shame that her church family will show her when they see the baby bump. Fear of being suddenly thrust into a different stage of life that will make her stick out like a sore thumb among all her friends. And with all those fears and voices, she begins to entertain thoughts that she never dreamed of before. I need to solve this problem. I need to get out of this mess as fast as I can with no one else knowing. Congregation, it's fairly easy to be convinced of the pro-life cause until the crisis like this comes knocking at our door. Then what? What? In that desperate situation, our culture is standing ready with an open door with an apparently quick and easy fix called abortion. Our culture pushes a devastating message that first dehumanizes the unborn child and then systematically kills it for you. It says you need to live your life at the expense of this child's life. On the other hand, moralism can thrive in a church context, and it too pushes a devastating message, one that crushes people with an unshakable burden of shame. It says you've ruined your life forever. Due to your mistakes, there's no life left to live, at least not here. No thank you. Written over both messages are doom and despair and destruction. Is there another message, another way? Well, friends, that's where the gospel comes in. The gospel takes away every justification for intentionally destroying another innocent human life. But the gospel gives far more than mere condemnation that destroys our own lives. The gospel message says to us sinners, we can live a new life, not at the expense of the child or yourself, but at the expense of Christ's. And friends, the goal of this message then is to help us to see and experience the fullness of that life as it's found in Christ again this morning. Because when we grasp the truth of the incarnation and the purpose of God's purpose for the incarnation, then we are able to stand for the lives of the unborn and show love for those who are burdened by shame. All of that flows from the message of the incarnation. And so that's what we're looking at this morning, the unplanned pregnancy, the unplanned pregnancy. Our text has history's most important pregnancy that's unplanned by the mother, namely Mary, but a pregnancy, of course, that was perfectly planned in eternity by the triune God. Well, that's our title, The Unplanned Pregnancy. We have two points, and in these points, we want to answer two key questions. The first point is the start. The start, and we're asking the question, when does human life begin? First point, the start. 
When does human life begin? And that's an important question. And as technology improves, biology is increasingly confirming that human life does not begin at birth, but it begins at the moment of conception. The unborn child is a human being who's been knit together in the womb by God. We recently studied Psalm 139. And we then have no right to artificially deny that human being the status of personhood, as some want to do. But let me tell you now why I selected this text today. Uh, We're so familiar with reading Luke 1 during the days of Advent leading up to Christmas. Uh, We read Luke 1 in December. That's appropriate, of course. In fact, it's right to read this passage and rejoice in this passage and the truth of it all year round. And yet that's not the point I'm making this morning. The question I want us to face this morning is, when did the incarnation begin? When did Christ's human life begin? And the wrong answer, which we might be tempted to say, is at Christmas. The incarnation didn't start with the birth of Jesus. We actually need to look nine months earlier, before the birth of Jesus. The incarnation began the moment that the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary, as verse 31 says, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. That's the promise, the announcement, the Spirit's going to conceive a son in Mary's womb and that son will grow and develop in her womb and then that son will pass through the birth canal during labor and be born and be called Jesus. And so congregation, that right there is why it's so fitting to read Luke 1 at this time of the year. Tomorrow is March 25th, which takes us nine months before Christmas. And that reminds us that it's at this time of year that the word became flesh. Because the word became flesh not when he was born, but when he was conceived. And so you see the question of when did human life start, it's not just about me or my baby. It's actually a massive theological question. At what moment in time did the eternal son of God join the human race? When did he unite himself irreversibly to a true human nature? The wrong answer is as a baby in the manger. That's further along the development. The right answer is when the spirit mysteriously and miraculously fertilized one of the Virgin Mary's eggs in her womb. Verse 35, the angel points to the supernatural creative work of the Spirit here. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And there we're lovingly being pictured for us what we see in Genesis 1 verse 2, the Spirit hovering over the darkness and void of creation to give new life. And in a glorious way, he's doing this over the Virgin Mary, to give this miraculous conception. Therefore, also that holy one, that holy embryo, that holy baby who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so the first major point we're making this morning is that the incarnation began pre-birth in the womb of Mary. The eternal Son of God, who spoke all things into being, came so low as to become a voiceless, vulnerable human embryo. That should make us worship. Uh, this week, uh, the boys stumbled into my room and they had a black and white grainy picture of eight week old preborn Olivia. They found it in her closet. And you could just make out where her head was developing and her fingers and her feet. And I asked, Who is that? And they rightly answered, That's Olivia. Yes. Amen. That's right. That is Olivia. The preborn child is the same person as the living child that emerges from the womb. Well, Jesus humbled himself to become so low, to be like that. So weak, so vulnerable, a developing embryo in the womb. 
And for this reason, when Mary, after hearing this message, hurries over to Elizabeth's house, she runs in the door, and don't think it's just one person passing through that doorway, it's two. There's Mary and unborn child Jesus. And so Elizabeth exclaims, verse 42, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, but why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? And so, yes, Jesus is the fruit of Mary's womb. He receives his human nature from her. And for nine months, he's growing and receiving nutrients from her. And yet, in the womb, he is distinct from her. Elizabeth calls him, the unborn baby, my Lord. The fruit of Mary's womb is not Mary's body or Mary's choice. He is the unborn God-man, my Lord, a distinct human life. And so here's the point we're making. To be pro-life, which is not always easy, but to be pro-life is not some added extra for the Christian. It's not some tacked-on good idea that doesn't really relate to the message of Christianity. It's actually woven into the fabric of the Christian message and the true story of Christ's incarnation. Christ's human life started at conception, and so does every other human life. This is why Christians are against abortion, because it's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings, and abortion does just that, It destroys the life of the unborn child, and we've been doing that in the West for a long time now. In the U.S. alone, a million unborn children have been murdered every year since 1960. That's well over 60 million children. And to put that in the context of Canada, our population right now is 38 million This is a major moral and human rights issue that we must be concerned about. That's point number one, the start. Life begins at conception, and this is why this matters. But number two, and secondly, this is our final point, the shame. The shame. And here we're answering another very important question. Where can I go with my shame? And maybe that's the question you're asking this morning. Where can I go with the shame of a pregnancy outside of marriage? Or the shame of an abortion? Or the shame of encouraging someone else to get an abortion? There's a lot of shame that people are dealing with when it comes to these things. And shame, it's something that's that's hard to define, but it's something that we've all felt. Uh, Since Adam's fall in the garden, the first thing we read there in Genesis 3, the first thing our parents felt after the fall was shame. And so they tried to hide from the face of God. That's what shame does. It leads us to run away from God. At least we try to. This is the history of the fallen human race. It's the history of all of us. Uh, We have sinned against God, and our guilt says... I did something bad, which is true. I broke God's law. The guilt is this objective voice of condemnation. But shame is different. It seems to personalize it. It shouts, not just I did something bad, but I am bad. I am a criminal. I am an outcast. Shame is powerfully pictured for us in the Bible in what the leper cried out. Unclean unclean, stay away. Now, sin leads to both, guilt and shame. In ourselves, we are all objectively guilty before the court of heaven. We need forgiveness of our sins. That is our greatest need. Sin also leads to shame, but there's a different relationship. Shame can come from our own sins. It does flow downstream from our own sins, but it can also come confusingly from the sins of others against us. 
Think of the horrific story of Tamar, who was raped by her brother Amnon. 2 Samuel 13, 19 describes her, the victim of such horrific crimes. Her, the victim, running away covered in shame while the perpetrator felt nothing. Shame can do that. But either way, from our own sin or from the sin of others against us, shame needs a different remedy than guilt. Shame is internalized, and so it needs a whole identity shift. I am unclean. I am a criminal. And that's about a statement about who I am. And I, and I won't be released from my shame until I can find a new identity handed to me. Shame weaves its way into the fabric of our being, and so it makes us insecure about ourselves. And therefore, it makes us insecure in relationships. Relationship with God, like Adam and Eve, we run from him. Relationships with others as well. Shame acts as a wall all around us that keeps love from touching our heart. We think if someone else truly knew us, then they would never love us. And so we try to protect ourselves, and in doing so, we cut ourselves off from relationship. We isolate, we try to run and hide, or if we don't isolate, we replicate. And what I mean by that is we pass on our own sense of shame to others. We become bullies who shun others or beat them up out of a sense of our own insecurity. Where do we go with our shame? It makes such a mess. It makes such a mess in a family. It makes such a mess in a church family. Is there any cure for shame? Where do we go? Well, again, our text points us to the only place to go. We could focus on the shame that this pregnancy would have caused Mary, and believe me, it would cause her shame. And yet she embraced it by God's grace for the sake of Christ. She was betrothed to Joseph, but not yet married. There was huge social stigma attached to being pregnant at this point, even though there was no sin in this pregnancy on Mary's part. But Mary can't help us deal with our shame. She can be an example, maybe a model in certain things, but she can't truly help us. We need to look at the shame of Mary's child, Jesus. And friend, if you're here this morning wondering what God is like, well then come with me and look at Jesus, the Son of God, who reveals the Father to us. This one, this babe who's been conceived in the womb of Mary, come and look at him. Look at him humbling himself, not stepping away from the shame of sinners, but stepping into the shame of sinners. The Son of God clothed himself in our humanity so that he might identify himself with us. He took our human nature so that he might share our experiences and our shame. Turn with me, if you can, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, this is towards the back of the Bible, Hebrews 12, page 1846, and I want to have this well-known text in front of you, Hebrews 12, verse 2, so you can see it for yourself there, Hebrews 12, verse 2, it's a beautiful summary of Christ and his whole incarnation. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you understand what that means? Despising the shame. This is here talking about the shame that Jesus Christ willingly put himself through. And it says he despised that shame. And, and this maybe is confusing. What, what do we mean by this? Uh, does this mean he doesn't like the, sh the shame? That's not actually what the author is communicating to us. To despise the shame in simple terms mean that Jesus thought little of all the shame he was going through. Or to say it another way, all the shame of his life, the shame of his crucifixion, he thought was a small price to pay for the goal that he was accomplishing. 
It's of little value, little price. And this text is so important for us because it opens up the heart of Christ to us. Because when we go back and we read the Gospels and we see the huge uh, levels of shame that he endures, and we hear that he says, this is a small price to pay to accomplish my goal of glorifying the Father through the salvation of shameful sinners, that shows us the heart of God in Christ. And when we go back to the Gospels, we find shame, the shame of Jesus. John 8, verse 41, the Pharisees, in a roundabout way, accused Jesus of being born of fornication. That was the word on the street in Christ's day. Oh, yeah, you were, you were conceived out of marriage. You were born of fornication. Uh, Mary got pregnant. She was your mother. She got pregnant before she was married, and you're the result of it, Jesus. You are an illegitimate child. He wore the shame of that in his life. John 8, 40, 48, the same chapter, they called Jesus a Samaritan, which is about the biggest insult a Jew could give. You're, you're a half-breed. You're a mix. Pagan, part Jew, a wannabe. You have no place among us. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That same verse, they say he's demon-possessed. Just think about that. God himself accused by his creatures of being aligned with Satan. Have you ever had false accusations thrown your way? To know the shame of it? To have your reputation dragged through the mud? To be tarnished? This one knew shame. But it wasn't just his enemies. Jesus had the shame of being abandoned by all his disciples. For three years, he poured himself into these men, into these friends. No longer do I call you servants, but friends. And at the height of it all, they bolted from him and ran. Have you ever given time and energy to someone to invest in their life, to mentor them, to disciple them, to encourage them? And all they give you is a no thank you after all the time and tears and prayers and energy and effort? Well, Jesus experienced that from all of his followers. He knew the shame of being on the surface what looked like a failed teacher. He had the shame of one friend selling him for the price of a slave. Judas looked at Jesus and weighed him out for 30 pieces of, of silver. Jesus, I'm going to estimate your value at about the price of a slave. Have you ever felt worthless to someone? Looked down on as if you have no value? His own friend, Judas, counted Jesus, the king of heaven, of no more value than the bondservant. Jesus was shamed by the high religious leaders, the, those in high places. Uh, they brought false accusations against him, and they thought Jesus wasn't worthy of a fair trial. Yes, if it was someone powerful, important, we'll, we'll listen closely, we'll make sure the arguments all line up. But for him, he's not worthy of a fair trial. And they shamed him when they spit on him. Picture that. Have you ever been spat on before? To be so despised by someone that, that they're spitting on you? And it's not just one, but a whole crowd of, of respectable people spitting on you. And then slapping you, which in this culture, again, to be slapped on the cheek is the most shameful thing you could endure. They intentionally demeaned him and counted him as scum of the earth. When Jesus says in Psalm 22, I'm a worm and no man. You know what he's talking about. This is what it felt like. I feel like a maggot. That's my value. In the eyes of others. Pilate shamed him when he washed his hands of this innocent one. Here's one not worth defending. The Roman soldiers shamed him when they mocked him. They entertained themselves by dishonoring him publicly. They stripped off his clothes. They exposed him in the sight of others. 
They abused him and put a purple robe on him in mockery. They wanted him to feel that he had no dignity. And then they crucified him. If in the Jewish culture, to be slapped in the face was the high watermark of being shamed, in the Roman culture, there was nothing more shameful than the Roman cross. Nothing more humiliating, nothing like being crucified. A Cicero, the great Roman orator, he said it was shameful for the word crucifixion to be on the lips of a Roman. If you're going to be an honorable Roman, don't even say the word crucifixion because it's going to shame you. It's going to take you down to levels you don't deserve to belong to because you are a Roman citizen. And here is the God of heaven, the Lord of glory, crucified publicly by a main road so that others would look on him in shame. And when the Jews passed by, they shook their heads. They made jokes about him. Come on. I thought you could heal people. I thought you could save people. Get down from the cross if you think you're that, that big of a, of a shot. Save yourself. The criminals on the cross even reviled him. They joined him. These, these people who had spent their lives in thievery, they make fun of him. They turn on him. Psalm 69, verse 19, gives us a window into Christ's experience. Psalm 69, verse 19 says, You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink, insult into injury. Psalm 69, verse 7, For your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. What was Jesus wearing on the cross? Shame. Shame. Worst of all, as the sin bearer, As the one who had come to deal with all his people's guilt and shame, on the cross, Jesus felt the shame of experiencing abandonment of the Father. Jesus experienced what it was to be alienated and separated from God. Isaiah 53, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to crush him. And this one was crushed and cursed made a curse so that sinners like you and I might be blessed. Do you see how relevant the gospel is? Do you see how relevant the Christmas story is and Good Friday is and Easter is? We all have guilt. We all have shame. And you don't know God unless you see him as the one who willingly, for the joy that was set before him, endured all this, counting it a small price, 50 cents as it were, to pay in order to win back his bride. He went through all this. He experienced the curse that the benediction that's pronounced at the end of the service, the benediction of God's face shining on his people might shine on us. And so he took the curse. He experienced all this so that our old identity might be crucified with him on the cross. The identity that says, I am a criminal, I am unclean, I am a murderer or an adulterer or proud or self-righteous or whatever it is. My old identity is crucified there. The moment I have this Christ for myself through faith, I'm united to him. And then we receive a new identity in him, no longer criminal, but child of God. And all of this of his grace. And so, friend, no matter how deep our shame is, we can't say no one has ever experienced the depths of shame that I have. 
We all have different experiences of shame, but Jesus experienced the deepest, deepest depths by far. This Good Friday, read again the gospel accounts. And then go to Hebrews and read again. Ponder what it says. And see how these things are true. Let me bring us to a close by reading a story of a woman from Northern Ireland. Uh, her name is Sarah. And she was in university in England, far from family and friends. And in her loneliness, she wrongly, sinfully sought comfort in the arms of a man. Here's how she continues. A few weeks later, I found out that I was pregnant and was in turmoil. I had been brought up Roman Catholic and believed that life begins at conception. The father of our baby wanted me to have an abortion and made it very clear that he would not support me in any other decision. Silenced by my shame, far from family and friends, I contacted a family member for advice. She flew to visit me and was clearly concerned about me and about my situation and the impact that it would have on our family. We talked about the family secret of a child conceived outside of wedlock and the ramifications that this might have. We weren't sure how our family would cope with this latest news, and we thought it might be more than some could bear. She agreed with the advice of the father for the sake of our family and for my future career. With the shame of my situation ringing in my ears, I made an appointment at the nearest abortion clinic. It was far, far, far too easy. As I was so clearly distressed at the appointment, the medical staff advised that the fetus be terminated for the sake of my mental health. When I went into the hospital for the abortion, my body broke out in a rash all over, responding to the terrible things I was about to do. As if in a trance, I just kept going, thinking that somehow it would rewind my story and let me return to my final year at university as if nothing had gone wrong. There were years of guilt and denial. One of my biggest regrets is that I even advised a friend to do what I had done. To this day, I thank God that she didn't listen to me. When her beautiful son was born, my heart broke in pieces. How could I have ever suggested it? How could I ever live with myself for what I had done? I went to Mass so many times, hoping to hear that I could be forgiven, but heard only the condemnation of my sin. I walked my life down a dark, dark path as I continued to look for love and acceptance in all the wrong places. Still silenced by my shame, I spoke mostly to those who I knew would support my decision, to counselors and therapists who helped me draw pie charts of responsibility, thinking it would help me diminish my own, but it didn't. I married in my 30s, and my husband and I have two wonderful sons together. I'd always wanted three children, but we met too late in life for that to happen. Before I became a Christian, I had been convinced God would take one of my sons from me in punishment for my sin. It took over 20 years for me to hear the good news. I no longer needed to bear the burden of my guilt and shame. I heard that at the cross, Jesus paid the price for all my sins and that if I believed in him, I could be set free from the punishment I deserved to flourish into the woman he created me to be. I became a Christian there and then and felt a peace that I had never known before. My longing for love and acceptance was a dangerous thing. In fear of an earthly family's wrath and shame, I made the worst decision of my life. But graciously, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, took the only wrath I ever really needed to fear and bore the shame that I could not bear on himself at the cross. He alone has set me free from the shame that silenced me, set me free to flourish in his love and acceptance, the very love and acceptance that I crave my whole life. I pray that my story will help encourage someone to mirror the Father's everlasting arms by encircling a hurting woman in pregnancy crisis. I pray that it may encourage a woman in such a crisis to remember our Heavenly Father's love, the one who knit each woman together in their own mother's womb, the one who sent an angel to Mary to ask her to bear his only begotten Son incarnate, unborn in her womb. This Jesus, who would not break a bruised reed, 
and who gathered infants into his arms when all around him thought they were worthless. If this is you or someone you love, please know that there is hope. There is a future, even if it's not the one you thought it would be. If it's not too late, you can make a different choice than I did and meet your little one in this life. But even if you've passed that point, you too can be set free from any shame you may feel, set free to flourish in the love and acceptance of the one who came to seek and save the lost. Friend, it's not too late. There's nothing that can't be forgiven. There's no shame that Christ doesn't understand and everything that he touches with his gracious light will one day glow with the radiance of his gospel hope. And church family, it's not too late for us. By the Spirit's power, we can be those who stand for the life of the unborn and who show love for those burdened with shame. All because of this Christ, this incarnate Son of God, who was conceived and crucified for sinners. Amen. Let's sing of the goodness of God. Psalter 396, 1, 3, 4, and 6. 396, 1, 3, 4, and 6. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the sympathizing high priest who is fully acquainted with life in this world, with the shame that we carry with the sufferings that we endure. And you call us, you invite us tenderly to come and to pour out our hearts before you. And to know that you ever live to make intercession for your people but you are also the high priest who has accomplished your work of being the sin bearer, the one who 
sacrificed yourself in love, in full willingness. No one took your life from you. You gave it of yourself for your enemies, for shameful ones, so that our relationship with God might be healed. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that for those among us who still have broken relationships with God, that they, by your Spirit, might come to you today and experience the peace and restoration and the love of being called a child. And Lord, for your children, help us to be strong in your grace. When we are tempted to believe lies, may we believe the gospel and may we cling to the gospel. May we cling to you, Lord Jesus, and may we hold you out to others as the only hope in this world. Your law is good. It keeps us away from pain and sin, and we praise you for the goodness of your law. And your gospel of grace is so needed for each of us. And so, Lord Jesus, we praise you. We praise you that you are the resurrection and the life. And may we then taste and see more of your goodness in this day. Forgive us for our sins in worship as well. Bless us, Lord, bless our children. We thank you for our parents who are seeking to raise our children in your fear. And may they come to you at a young age and uh, discover that you are one who welcomes the young. And so, Lord, help our Sunday school teachers and our pre-catechism teacher and bless this instruction to their hearts as well, we pray. In your mighty name, amen. Let's sing Psalter 306, stanzas one through four, here singing of the glory of God, but then also the condescension of God, uh, the one who is willing to come as an embryo and then be born and to live as a man in this world. Psalter 306, one through four. Following the benediction, we'll sing for doxology the hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain? We'll sing stanzas one, two, and three. Receive the Lord's blessing and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.